Hello everyone. Today we're going to go over alkenes, alkynes, and aromatics. So let's get started. So alkenes and alkynes are a little different than alkanes. In this case, they are considered unsaturated hydrocarbons, and that's important. That means that they contain at least one double or triple bond between the carbon atoms. So they do not contain the maximum amount of hydrogens that can be attached to each carbon atom. Instead, they have at least one shared pair, or two shared pairs, excuse me, okay, um, or three shared pairs of electrons between the carbon atoms. They at least have one double or one triple bond. And this is actually going to change the structure of the molecules and make them more linear and less able to bend. Now, because they are considered unsaturated, the important part here is to note they undergo addition reactions. And this is very unique to just alkenes and alkynes. So alkenes contain at least one double bond between two carbon atoms. And it's very flat. Um, so the atom and the double bond lies in the same plane. It doesn't really twist or move. So we really can't have a lot of conformations right around here. We can do some interesting things eventually on either side of the bond, but right here we're kind of stuck in place um, and we won't really bend right where that is. We can rotate on the ends. Now the simplest alkene that you can make is considered ethene, also known as ethylene. That's the common name. Um, it's used to accelerate the ripening of fruits. We use, you commonly see that used in trucks when fruits are usually picked green to get to the market. Okay, it is two carbon atoms connected by a double bond. And then on each side, you have two hydrogens completing and making sure that everything has a completed octet. So here, carbon, each carbon now technically has eight electrons because they're sharing four between the, um, here we go, one, two, three, four, right? Then we have five, six, seven, eight. So we're sharing four between the atoms and then each side is sharing their other pairs right there. An alkene is one that contains a triple bond. So it's when two carbon atoms share three pairs of valence electrons, the bond angle is very linear on this one. It's 180 degrees and there's absolutely no rotation. When you have a triple bond in place, that makes this portion of the molecule almost like a straight line and it's impossible to bend. The simplest alkyne that we can make is considered ethyne, also known as acetylene. Um, that's the common name. So the chemical formula is C2H2 and it's just the two carbon atoms connected by the triple bond and then you have one atom, one hydrogen atom attached to each end. And this is what is used in torches for welding. So right now, I just want to go over if we can identify whether they're an alkane, an alkene, or an alkyne. And then we can kind of discuss what means are going to happen afterwards. So this first one here, we see a triple bond, one, two, three. So this is going to become an alkyne with a Y. Technically, because there's four here, this becomes what normally would have been butane, but we're gonna separate and remove A-N-E and add Y-N-E into the name. So this becomes a butyne. And what we're gonna find out soon is that you're gonna name the position of this bond. This would be a two butyne. If we're looking here, one, two, three, four, five is the longest chain of carbons. We see a double bond. So this becomes an alkene. Technically, this would be pent for five. So now it's pentene, right? And this is actually gonna be a two pentene that's happening on the second, between the second and third carbon. Now don't forget, we gotta remember how to do these skeletal formulas. Each end of the line is considered a carbon atom. So one, two, three, four, this would become a 1-butene, okay? This is, again, another alkene because of the double bond here. 
And what you notice here, this is all single bonds. So this is our alkane. So we've gone from alkyne, alkene, alkene, alkane. And the alkane here, the longest chain, one, two, three, four, five. I know you guys know how to name this one. This is pentane, right? Five singly connected carbon is pentane. We number and start on the side closest to the branches. So here would be one, two, three. We have a two and a three. And in this case, we both have these lines. And those straight lines up mean that on the end is just a carbon surrounded by hydrogen. So that's a methyl group. So we now have a 2,3-dimethyl pentane. So there they are for you. So now let's go over naming, just kind of like we did right there. Where we name, we still name just like we did with alkanes. We use the longest chain of carbon first. And we take that longest chain and we name it its base name. So we use the alkane name. But now we're going to drop A and E. And if there's a double bond, we're going to change the ending to E and E. And if we have a triple bond, then we're going to drop the A and E and add Y and E to represent that it's an alkyne. The other important things that we need to do now after we've numbered that longest chain is that, or kind of long chains, that we need to number it. And we want to number it with the carbon closest to it, or the end carbon closest to that double or triple bond, starting as number one. Okay, so we want to have that triple bond. We want to end at the end closest to that double or triple bond, or start at the end closest to that double or triple bond. And then we have to number each carbon. And we're going to give the location of everything um, in alphabetical order, all the substituents. We also have to give the location of that double or triple bond. So let's just go through this first, these first two examples, OK? So here we have example A and B. The first thing we have to do is name the longest chain. So here, one, two, three, four. Four is our longest chain. So four becomes butte. So it would normally be butane, drop the A and E and change it to E and E. This is now butene. Here, this one gets a little more difficult. So this is a really good example to know. If we count the longest chain here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven is technically hept, H-E-P-T. And instead of A and E, we're going to add Y and E for this triple bond. So this now becomes heptine. So you just have to remember at the end. And why is this such a straight line here? And you almost want to say, oh, well, this is just one here. But remember, at the end of the bonds, this is technically two, one, two. It's linear just because the molecule itself is extremely linear when we have those triple bonds. We don't allow any form of bending or zigzagging like you might see here when we just have single bonds. So when we number these now, we're going to number them on the end closest to those double or triple bonds. So you'd number starting here or here, okay? So when we start numbering one, two, three, four, this now becomes a one butene, okay? Because the bond is between carbon one and two. This one, one, two, three, four, because the bond is between two, three, this becomes a two heptine. So we're just noting where the bond is. So we're going to put a one and then a dash the name. So that means the bond, hence the ending here, this name, is occurring at position one. Or in this case, with heptine, it's at position two. The last thing you do is you have to name any substituents and give them an alphabetical order. Remember, I'm saying their position and their name. In this case, in example A, there are no substituents. So we just leave the name alone as one butene. In B, however, you do have this one group handing out here. And this group here is a methyl group. And this is at position four. So we do a four methyl two heptine. And that's the name. Now, if we have any ones that are cyclic, so cycloalkenes, 
um, we will note that it's not really possible to have a cycloalkyne with a Y. Um, so we don't have to worry about naming those. But for us, we're just going to focus on cycloalkenes. Now, in this case, we'll have a double bond. If there are no substituents whatsoever, so if there's nothing added onto the group, you don't actually need to note the position because we're always going to assume the position is happening between one and two. And we can just name this as cyclopentene. If we do, however, have any substituent groups here, we're always going to assume that the bond is between one and two. So you're going to start numbering so that the bond appears between one and two, and that the group, the branch, the substituent, whatever you want to call it, the group that's coming off, now comes at the lowest number possible. So in this case here, we're going to number towards the right side. So this becomes one, two, three, and at position three, we have something. So again, we don't have to um, consider and state where the bond location is here in the cyclic one because we always consider that bond to be at one and two. And so we'd always write one as understood. So now this becomes what we consider a three methyl cyclohexene. We don't have to state three methyl one cyclohexene. So just three methyl cyclohexene. The one is always understood here. So let's try to name these following compounds. Um, and we'll go from there. I think this is going to be some good tries and good examples to go through. I'm going to make my screen a little bigger. And I apologize, it's a little dark here. But let's focus on A right now. So on A, we've got to count the longest chain of carbons. One, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five. So five is the longest chain. So our, best, our base name here is going to be pent. Okay, we would normally write pentane, but because we have this double bond, we're going to end with pentene, E-N-E. -E. So we change the ending to represent that double bond. Now we have to start numbering on the end closest to that bond. So when we see this CH3, C double bond, CH, CH2, CH3, and then here would be a CH3. When we start numbering, we're going to number on this end. And we're going to number, so this becomes carbon 1. This is 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now we need to know the position of everything. So now that we know that we have a pentene, we're going to say that we actually have a two pentene because the bond is occurring between two and three. So we'll write a two and then we'll put a hyphen in, two pentene. So that's our base name. But we have a group attached to it. Now remember this group going down is still just part of the actual molecule itself. Okay, it's part of the longest chain. We never end on a CH2, we'll always end Okay, with an ending of CH3, where carbon has a support bond. So don't worry about the weird bend here. But here we do have the group. On the two, we have a methyl group here. Okay, so what we'd write in front, because it's the only other thing, is the two dash methyl, and then we put in our other dash. So we have a two methyl to pentene for that one. If we're looking at our next one, in this case we have an alkyne. So with our alkyne, if we're looking at it, we have a carbon, we have this hydrogen here, then we have our triple bond, then one carbon, then it has our CH group, okay, and then attached to the CH, I'm just going to draw it out so you can see all four bonds. Here's my H. We have our CH3 groups. So in this case here, we're going to number the end closest to our longest chain, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. So this becomes carbon one. Oh, I can't see it up there, sorry. So this is one, 
two, here would be carbon three. I'll put the H back here to leave it with it. And then I'm gonna go, this is carbon four, I'm gonna go up. You could go down, doesn't matter, as long as it's the longest chain. So now we have a group. So this is our special group, our branch. And if we're looking at this branch here, okay, this is at position three. And this happens to be a methyl. M-E-T-H-Y-L, because it's an alkyl group. So it's a three methyl group. I don't have any other things to note, except that I have my triple bond occurring at carbon one. So when we write our full name out, we're going to use our base name, which will again, our base name here is four. So this is butane as our base name. But instead of putting A-N-E, we end it with Y-N-E. So this becomes butyne. We have to note the position of it. It happens at carbon one, so you do place the one here, okay? So this is now a one butyne. And now we have to put our substituents in front in alphabetical order. Since we already know what they are and there's only one, we just write our three methyl dash one butyne. So that's how we would name that one. So again, you name, count the longest chain, name that as your base name, start numbering where they are, and then note any substituents that are there. The other thing I want you to feel comfortable doing is drawing these 10 structural formulas for each one. So if I asked you to draw a 2-hexine with a Y, let's take the name apart. Hexine means that we have six connected carbons together, and YNE means that there's a triple bond. So first things first, just start drawing your six connected carbons. Because you don't see a word cyclo, we know it's a complete straight chain. So we'll just start drawing one, two, three, four, five, okay, and then six. So here are my six connected carbons. And then what the Y and E means, and this is up to you, you can, I always like to number it up here from right to left if I'm doing it on my own, but it can be up to you. I'm going to number one, two, three, four, five, I'm just going to draw them all out, six, so those are my numbers. So in here, a two hexine means that at carbon two, there's a triple bond, so let's put in a triple bond, one, two, three, okay? Now because there's nothing else in this name, there's no other prefixes coming out in front of here, that's the end. What we have to do is just make sure that carbon has all four bonds that it needs. So on the end here, this would become a CH3. Here, we actually don't need anything. This would be its four bonds, one, two, three, four. So you just leave it, connect it together. Same with this carbon on either side. So again, one, two, three, then one. So but ending on carbon four, we're gonna need two bonds, two bonds, and then three bonds to complete it. So then this becomes a CH2, CH2, CH3. So this is how you would draw a two hexine. When it comes time to drawing a three methyl three hexene, again, hex means six. So we put on our six carbons one, two, three four, five, six. And we can label them. Again, I'm going to start here. One, two, three, four, five, six, up above. And at position three, one, two, three, that means there is a double bond because we see the E and E, okay? So that means between three and four, I'm going to put a double bond in. So there goes my double bond. However, 
this name does say that there's other things attached to it. It says 3-methyl. So at position 3, I have a methyl group. And a methyl group is a CH3. So that's everything in the name. There's nothing else. We have our 3-methyl, 3-hexene. So what we're going to do now is make sure that carbon makes four bonds and we'll fill in the hydrogens. So again, our ends become CH3s, our middles become CH2s, except for this one here. We're going to leave this right alone. One, two, three, four. So we're going to move to the next one. One, two, three. This only needs one carbon bond. Okay. This one needs two. And then we have three. So when it comes to drawing the condensed structural formula, we're just condensing the hydrogens around it. So at the end, it's a CH3, CH2 to connect it to a carbon. Then we'll have our methyl branch down there. And then we're going to go across double bond carbon. Here we're just going to put one hydrogen attached to a CH2 to a CH3. So just take your time. Remember, draw that longest chain out first, then place, number it, place whatever you have that are the special groups in that you see anything out in front. So knowing where that double or triple bond is in any groups. And then what you do with what's left, just make sure all the remaining carbons have four bonds and that you've saturated what's left, we just fill in with hydrogens, okay? So let's move on. Here again are those drawings for you, just so you can see them again. Because these are flat molecules, what's really neat is we can have a thing called cis and trans isomers. So these have the same exact formula, but they have different physical and chemical properties because they're bent a specific way. And because this double bond can't rotate now, so that means that these are no longer just conformations. Um, if you're bent up or bent down, it means you're actually kind of special and you'll react in the body a certain way. And you become what we call cis or trans. So up above here, you see a cis 2-butene. And down here, this would be a trans 2-butene. So we denote whether the atoms are bonded on the same or opposite sides of the double bond. Okay. So in this case, we have cis and trans here. So if we talk about cis-trans isomers, um, cis means that groups are attached on the same side of the double bond. And a trans isomer, groups are attached on the opposite side of the double bond. So in this case, if we look at a 1,2-dichloroethene, we can actually make a cis-trans isomer. If the chlorines are on the same, um, if we consider the same side of the double bond, they're both up versus down. So if we make a little goal post, we kind of consider up this way, this is considered a cis bond. However, if they are opposite each other, this becomes a trans bond. So same side cis, opposite side trans. Same side cis, opposite side trans. Okay? Try to help you remember that in that case. Um, and these are actually kind of important to know that with cis trans isomers, they do not and will not occur if one of the carbon atoms on the side of the double bond, so we're talking about just on either side of the double bond, if one side has identical groups, like just two hydrogen atoms, this can no longer be in a cis trans arrangement. You actually have to have four distinct groups, you can't have two identical groups. Same here on this case, if we're looking at a 2-methylpropene, even though it has that double bond, we cannot be in a cis-trans bond because these are the same. And the reason why it matters is because the ends of these carbons can still rotate. Um, so these bonds can rotate and move, but either way, if I rotated them, they'd be the same thing. Same here, if I switch these sides, they'd still be the same molecule regardless. There's no possibility of a cis-trans isomer here. 
So if we're going around naming, remember, if we're looking at this example using a 1,2-dibromoethene, in this case, if the bromines are on the same side, like meaning up, so if they're both facing up or if they're both facing down, that means they're stiff. If they are opposite each other, okay, then they are in a trans formation. Same, opposite, opposite, trans. So we can draw these um, now. And when we draw them, and if we're asked if we can draw and predict, we have to just draw out our double bond, okay? And if we know, we're going to start now looking at what these groups are. Because I have a one carbon group here and a hydrogen, and on the other side of the double bond, I have a one hydrogen and a three carbon long group here. Yes, this can be drawn in the cis trans arrangement. So we can have two different drawings possible for this isomer. And if we draw it in the cis isomer, the two carbon groups are on the same side, so they can either be both down or both up. And if it's in trans, the carbon groups are across from each other, okay? One will face up and one will face down. Isomers in pheromones, um, hormones, and a few other things, they're actually really important. So pheromones are chemical messengers, they're made by organisms. They work to help in attraction, alarm, and just signals in general. And this is just one example of the silkworm moth. We also see them in even um, spices, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the best examples that I can talk about with cis trans isomers is actually retinol and the human eye. So retinol has two forms uh, it has a cis and a trans form. And when light hits it, it actually switches between the two, cis and trans. And it's going back between the cis and trans, it actually helps send the signal of the image you see to the brain. So it's really responsible for your sight. So just an example, um, going through some examples so you can tell whether they're cis or trans. If we're looking at A, this one, because the bromines are on the same upper side, Okay, this is considered cis. In here, if we're looking at B, our carbon groups are opposite each other, so this is trans. And this last one is neither, okay? In this one, we don't have, we have identical atoms on this side, so it's not the same. So now let's just talk about the reactions that these alkenes can go through. And these are the same that alkynes can go through as well. But we're more likely going to see them in alkene versions. So in alkenes, they undergo what we call addition reactions. In this case, we're adding something to the double bond and breaking it apart. And we're going to result in an alkene. So the main types of addition reactions that I want you to know, there are four types. We have hydrogenation. That's when we're adding hydrogen. Halogenation, when we're adding halogen. Hydrohalogenation, when we're adding what we call a hydrohalide, basically HCl, HBr, HI, hydrogen attached to a ha um, halogen. And then hydration, when we're adding water. And the products we make in hydrogen or halogenation, in these cases we're making alkanes, in a, halo, in a hydrohalogenation, we're making what we call haloalkane. And in a hydration, we're going to make an alcohol. So let's go through hydrogenation first. This is the simplest one. This is when we add two hydrogens and we break that double bond. The bond almost swings open and each hydrogen pops on each carbon and we just become an alkane. So in this case, the 2-butene becomes butane. We see this in hydrogenation of oils. Um, this is how we can make margarine shortening, uh, even peanut butter, anything that has hydrogenation in it or hydrogenated. In this case, when we add hydrogen across the double bond, we produce these solid forms of these oils. Um, and they have compounds that have higher melting points. They're solid at room temperature. And, but this is where we can get into uh, trans fat, and we'll talk about that later. 
but in general, this is just an example. If I asked you to draw this, this is a hydrogenation of one butene. And we want to know what the product is. So in this case, if we're looking at our butene, we have our CH2. I'm going to draw it out fully, the full expanded. Okay, here's hydrogen. Here's my other CH2. And we have a CH3. I'm just going to expand it all. And we're adding H2, which means two hydrogens together. What's going to happen, and don't worry, the platinum over here just means the platinum is acting as a catalyst. So this double bond is going to break. It's going to break open, and one end will swing up, and so will the others. Okay? And the hydrogens, one hydrogen will pop on one side, and the other hydrogen will pop on the other. So when you draw it out, again, what you're just seeing is there's that new hydrogen in there. And we've gone from a 1-butene to a butane. There's a pop carb hydrogen there. Okay. And if you were drawing it just condensed, remember CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. So there you go. So if we ask to draw the follow, what will happen? Again, if you're looking here in this one, for the first one, when we break this apart, you're breaking up that double bond, the splitting. This is a two butane. The middle will open up. So you still have the same CH3, but now, let me just draw it this way. The hydrogens open up here. Okay, so the bond will open up and the hydrogens are added on top. Okay, one to each side. If you draw it like this, I'm perfectly okay. Remember condensing it down. Literally, it just becomes the same thing. This now becomes butane. Okay, for the next one, if we're looking at cyclopentane, oops, cyclopentene, excuse me. I drew it slightly different, but you get it. Sort of down here, put it up here. When we break this bond open, these are going to break open, okay, and open up. Because remember, in this case, when we're looking at all of these are technically CH2s, okay? And so in the case of the double bond, you just don't have one of those as the double bond. These are just CHs. So when the double bond breaks, we open up and the hydrogens stick in. And we literally just become the alkane version. So you just become cyclopentane. We would have broken it down. Now halogenation, on the other hand, we're adding a halogen atom to it, or two halogen atoms, and we're going to form a dihaloalkane of some sort. So in this case, you could add chlorine, bromine, iodine, fluorine even into the mix. And wherever you broke that bond, and wherever the bond is, is it going to become something? Um, it would be like a 1 2 or a 2 3 or a 3 4 dibromo, dichloro. And these occur rapidly, they don't need a catalyst. Um, and that's because of that, that group 7, those halogens are actually very reactive. So in this case, if I am looking at ethene, if I bring in bromine, it becomes a 1,2-dibromoethane. In this case, if I'm adding a total of four, this one I'm adding four chlorines, okay? And this is a propyne, a 1-propyne, and I'm adding four chlorines. This becomes, so kind of a bit of a mouthful, a 1,1,2,2. A one, one, two, two, Tetra chloro propane. Okay. So it's a little hard one. I won't give you anything this difficult. I'll give you something simple. 
Um, in this case, we can actually use an idea that bromine specifically is super, um, it's actually red by itself, but because it's very reactive and will highly, will go under these and double, break those double bonds very quickly, we can use this to test for unsaturation. So um, this is a common test when we're talking about looking at saturated versus unsaturated fat, is to add bromine in. And if bromine is added in the presence of an alkane, something that is saturated, the color of the red bromine persists in the state. If you add bromine to an alkene or an alkyne, wherever there is a double or triple bond that can undergo a reaction, the bromine will disappear and immediately be taken up and into those bonds. So you don't see that color. So it's a way of testing for unsaturation. So we can go through and do some more examples over here. So in this case, I'm gonna ask you to what's gonna happen in the halogenation. We have a 2-butene here, and we're gonna add chlorine to it. So in this case, I have the CH3, CH, and then I have my double bond CH, CH3, and I'm adding two chlorines. This bond is going to break apart, and it's going to open up, and we're going to have each chlorine appear on the bond. Oh, sorry, you couldn't see that at all. Okay, so when we write it, now you just have our CH3, CH, Cl, CH. Cl, CH3. And if we're writing the name, it becomes a 2,3 dichloro, and then this is butane. Okay, 2,3 dichlorobutane. The next one, if we're looking at cyclohexene and adding bromine, with our cyclohexene, here's our double bond here. Again, this double bond is going to break apart. And we're going to just add in where that bond used to be a bromine on each end. So now this becomes the double bond was between one and two. So now this becomes a one, two dibromo cyclo hex A N E because it's all single bonds. So I would like you to feel comfortable with going through and trying some examples of these um, for naming and drawing when we get into these ones as well. You'll see some on the exam. So in hydrohalogenation, in this case, we're adding a hydrogen halide. So we're adding actually a strong acid. We're adding HCl, HI, HBr, or HF. It has to be hydrogen and a halide. And we're going to make what we call a halo alkane. So we're going to divide out and break apart that bond. And to the side that has the most hydrogens, we're going to add the hydrogen because it's going to want to go to the side where it has more of its friends. And to the other side of the bond, we'll add the halogen atom. Okay. So in this case here, if I'm looking at one, two, three, four, this is again a two butene. It doesn't matter because each side has one attached hydrogen. So to one side, we'll add a hydrogen. To the other, we'll add the Cl. Same thing here in this case of our cyclopentane. It doesn't matter where it's going because they both have one attached hydrogen. So we'll add one hydrogen, and then in this case, one Br. Now, we do will have, it does occur in two steps when we have these reactions, and it will matter where the hydrogen goes eventually. It will go to the side that has the most hydrogen atoms. It's actually a rule, um, Macaulay's rule. I can't ever pronounce it right, but we'll get to it when we start talking about hydration as well. But in this case, why it actually matters and why it matters where that hydrogen goes and it matters that it goes to the side with the most is because we have this two-step reaction. And in this two-step reaction, we form what we call a carbocation. And that's when the hydrogen is going to bond in, and it's gonna to go to the side with the most hydrogen atoms. 
and it's going to create this carbocation that's positive. And then the negative halide ion, okay, the halogen, will come in and bond second. So this just happens in two steps. And because of this, we have this rule, okay, that the hydrogen is going to go to the carbon in the double bond that has the greatest number of hydrogen atoms attached directly to it. That's the part. It doesn't matter how many associates are in these other carbon-based groups. It's how many are attached directly to that carbon. So if we're looking at this case here, this side has one hydrogen directly attached. This side has none. So because of that, the side with the one hydrogen, that's where the hydrogen will attach. And the side with the methyl group is where the BR will attach. So it does matter. It's where it's directly attached. So let's try this example. Please excuse my little error here. This should be a CH2. But in this case, if you're looking here and it's drawn out, we have our double bond between our carbons. Here we have two hydrogens. This is going down to a CH2, CH2, CH3 group. And you have your other hydrogen. If we're adding HCl, we're going to break apart this double bond. It's going to split. Okay, so we'll have two options. When we have HCl, it does matter which side the hydrogen goes to. The hydrogen will go to the side with the most hydrogens directly attached to the carbon. So on this side, I have two. Here, I only have one. So this hydrogen is going to go all the way here, OK? And our chlorine is going to go to the side with the least. So it does matter, OK? Hydrogen has to go on the side with the most. So then when you're redrawing it, here this becomes a CH3. This will become that CH, and we'll still have that CH2, CH2, CH3 group. But now here would be the CL. Okay? So it does matter. It has to go to the side, okay, with the most hydrogens attached to it as you're going through. So if we're looking at hydration now, hydration follows the same exact rules as hydrohalogenation. In this case, the hydrogen will go to the carbon on the side with the most hydrogen atoms attached, and the OH or the hydroxide is going to go to the other carbon, okay? And then we form a special product now. We're forming a new family. Anytime we have an OH functional group, this becomes an alcohol, and we'll name it with a specific name, and you'll learn about that a little bit later. So again, in hydration, the hydrogen is going to the side with the most hydrogen atoms attached. If we're looking here at this one, it's going to go to the side of the CH2 versus the CH, okay, because it has one hydrogen directly attached. This has two directly attached. So the OH group would go here in the middle. So let's try to do this one. I want you to, what is the product of the hydration here? If we're drawing out the product, remember, if we're just looking at what's attached to this, I have a CH3 group, a CH3 group, I have my double bond, a carbon, I had one hydrogen, and then I have a CH2 and a CH3. So my double bond is going to break here, and it's going to open up. Now, I have to figure out which side will get the hydrogen, which side will get the, my hydroxide group. This side has no hydrogens attached to it, okay? None. Just carbon-based groups. This side has one hydrogen attached to it. Well, one is better than z more than zero, so this side will get the hydrogen because it's going to go to the side with more. And the other side is going to get that hydroxide group, that OH. OK? 
okay? And that's where the alcohol is going to form. So again, it does matter. The side of the hydrogen will go to the one with the more hydrogens. So if we asked you to draw the condensed structural formula of what's happening in all of these, remember in this case here in A, as we're being broken down, we're just adding chlorine. This is considered a halogenation because we're adding a halogen. We'll leave our CH3 alone our CH, then we'll have a CH here too, but the bond opens up between the two of them, and we're gonna put a chlorine atom in both. So it becomes a dichloro. So in this case, we're a one, two dichloro propane. If we're looking at our next one, when we're adding water, this is a hydration. We started with a CH3, then we're going to have our CH, CH, CH3. The double bond would have split open. Here it doesn't matter. Each side has a hydrogen. So one side arbitrarily will have the OH and one will have the other hydrogen. Okay. In this case it didn't really matter and if we flip the molecule still the same thing. And in our last one we have that cyclopentene. If we break apart the double bond, it's going to open up like this. And we're adding hydrogen to each side. So that just becomes a cyclopentene. And you can draw it with the hydrogens attached out, or you can just draw it by itself, whatever you like. These are the same thing. So here we have a halogenation, a hydration, and this last one is a hydrogenation. And there they are. Those are those answers for you. Um, I just want to briefly talk about polymers, but please know I'm actually not going to test you on this. So polymers are just large molecules that consist of smaller PDMUs called monomers. We'll see a lot of this when we get into starches and um, fats and lipids and, and carbohydrates, but we can make them synthetically as well, like polyethylene, polystyrene, nylon, teflon. All of these are just made by taking small alkenes and we put them under high temperature and high pressure and we can actually combine them together. And so we have that polyethylene or polystyrene. E and E means they actually have double bonds. So we're taking those monomers under high pressure and high temperature as ethene or ethylene, and to make polyethylene, basically plastic, high temperature, high pressure, we add them all together and we're actually breaking apart those double bonds. So I won't ask you anything, just know that a polymer is made up of monomers. But these are just examples for you. Um, but you do not have to, and you don't have to do this learning check either, okay? So do not worry. But I do want to go over aromatic compounds. So with aromatic compounds, this is actually important. They all have a benzene ring as their key structure. Now, a benzene ring is really specific and kind of unique. So um, it doesn't behave like an alkane uh, or it just it doesn't behave like an alkene itself. It behaves more like an alkene. So a benzene ring is a cyclo, basically a cyclohexene, but we have three double bonds. Here's one here, one here, and one here. And because of those three double bonds, they actually move and rotate. So the double bonds, if you've ever played with like a Jacob's ladder, they constantly rotate and move. So that bond that was here is now here, and the bond that was here has switched over to here. The bond that was here moved up top. And again, these bonds will move again, and you'll go back and forth, and the bonds just keep moving and rotating between them. Now, because the bonds keep rotating and moving, it's almost as if 
you have this little cloud. And remember, electrons are in clouds. You know, it kind of sounds strange. It's like a charged cloud. It's like instead of having a full double bond, you have one and a half bonds everywhere. So I'm going to draw this little dashed line as those half bonds. Okay? So it's, you're sharing the charge because they're constantly moving and flipping. So you don't necessarily have a double bond. We have like one and a half bonds in each case. And because we have that, we show it in this separate, this special way where we draw a circle, okay? That circle basically means we have those bonds that are rotating through, and they're rotating through so often that we've kind of separated and spread out the charge evenly around them. So we have like one and a half bonds. And because they're constantly moving, we can't use them. We can't catch them to have them in a reaction. Um, so they won't undergo addition reactions at all. They just can't because they're constantly moving. So they do not invent, this is important, benzene, which is a key component of an aromatic compound, does not undergo an addition reaction. So whenever you see it drawn with a circle, it basically means we can't touch it, okay? And because of that, it's going to behave like an alkane. So we can combust it, but we can never break those double bonds because we're almost sharing them like they're singly um, shared across. So in aromatic compounds, um, they're actually key components of fragrances. They get the name aromatic because they have a fragrance around them. So here is anise, tarragon, thyme. And vanillin, um, anything that has any form of an odor to it, has some form of an aromatic compound and probably a benzene ring. So what's key and important about aromatic compounds is that they tend to have higher melting points and boiling points because they have that really cool stability of that benzene ring. Um, they are not soluble in water unless they contain a substituent or a branch off the side, like an OH or a COOH. So they either have to contain an alcohol or they have to contain this, which is a carboxylic acid. They have a stable aromatic bonding system. That's that resonance structure that constantly moves around of that benzene ring. And they're resistant to many reactions that break up. Um, those systems. However, they're highly, highly flammable. So in this case, if we're looking at some other aromatic compounds that you might see or know of or heard of, TNT, okay? 2,4,6-trinitrotoluene. TNT is what is used to blow up and detonate things. Um, that is an aromatic compound. Again, highly explosive, highly flammable. Ibuprofen itself is actually, has an aromatic compound in it. Um, aspirin even has one, and vanillin. If we name them, we name them as benzene as the parent chain. So this becomes a methyl benzene or a chlorobenzene. And remember here, we don't have to number the side groups if it's one. If we have more than one, then we'll number them. And uh, we'll start with numbering the carbon that is, comes first with the Carbon that is, it will, ugh, will go with the one that comes first alphabetically. That will start as carbon one, whatever's attached to that, okay? And then we'll number from there. Just like we've done, we name it exactly as we do with the cycloalkanes, except now we're using benzene as the root word. So, but there are some special common names that you just need to know. You need to know that when there is a methyl group attached to a benzene, so a methyl benzene, this is known as toluene. And we use this, and it's kind of weird that organic chemistry is different, that they use this common name. It's been used for so often that this has become the actual name name of the compound um, that is just widely used and adopted. So toluene, aniline, when we have an amine group here and phenol, okay, when we have an alcohol attached to it. So these are the three you need to know. You just need to know them by their names, toluene, aniline, phenol. So when we, again, when we have two or more groups on the ring, um, we usually note their positions. However, sometimes we can have special positions that are important to know. 
and we can number them given the lowest numbers, which are known as IPAC naming. And we will always use IPAC naming. The other form of naming, known as a common name, uses what we call ortho-meta pair. And this is for when we have some common arrangements that we see in organic chemistry. If we have anything in the one, two position, we call that ortho. If we have anything in a one, three position, that's meta, and a one, four position is para. And these are only for basically ones that are in the cyclohexane arrangement or cyclohexene arrangement or a benzene arrangement. So anytime I have something in position one, two, okay? Position one, two, this is known as ortho. If I had the same thing, woo, sorry, this is why it was not in art and in science, very bad drawing. If I have a one, three, okay? This is a one, three. This is a one, two. One, three is meta. And then the one, four, that one's a little easier. That's one, and then position here is four, right across from each other. This is a one, four. This is the para arrangement. Orthometa para, okay? So those are just common names. So here is a 1,3, this is meta, a 1,4 ortho, para, excuse me, 1,4 para, and a 1,2 is ortho. The IPAC name is what we're using up top. So in this IPAC name, this becomes a 3 chlorotoluene. Because remember, whenever we have a methyl group attached to this benzene, this is Toluene, we're going to use that as its name, as its base name, and then just note where the position is from that. This becomes one, so two, three, a three chlorotoluene. That's the name I'm going to use. I'm not really going to test you on meta pair ortho, okay? Here is a one, four dichlorobenzene. And in this case, remember we have a phenol. The so OH is the group, so phenol, and this is at one. This would be two, so we have a two chlorophenol. The other one we have that's kind of weird is we have xylene. Xylene is pretty cool. It's when we have an isomer of, it's, xylene is a compilation of isomers of dimethylbenzene, meaning that we have two methyl groups on a benzene. Um, if we have them in the 1-2 arrangement, they're ortho, the 1-3 arrangement is meta, and the 1-4 arrangement is para. But xylene itself is made up of all of these liquids. And xylene, if you ever get into histology or you work in um, as, as a pathologist, but as a pathologist meaning um, in like a lab setting, looking at tissues and samples from individuals, you'll actually use xylene. Um, as a fix, and, and maybe you'll use uh, toluene as well. So the other ones to just kind of pay attention to is we're looking at these aromatic compounds with three or more substituents. Here, because we do not have any other things, there's no OH, there's no CH3, or there's no amine group, the base name to this one is just benzene. So we're gonna number it's just one of them, it's one. This would become a 1,3,5 trichlorobenzene. Here, because we have the CH3 group, this now becomes the functional group because this is toluene. So this becomes one. So we're going to number two, three, four. So this becomes a 4 bromo 2 chlorotoluene because we're naming them alphabetically. And in this case here, this one again is another toluene. And we number, it doesn't matter which way we go, in which direction here now, because either way we're hitting that in the same, low, same amount. Okay, so we go one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. Either way we get the same length of number. This here is a two, six, 
dibromal 4 chlorotoluene. So if I asked you what the correct name for this compound was, with this EL, this would just be a chlorobenzene. The other way of saying it is a 1 chlorobenzene. I'll accept either name as correct. Okay? So chlorobenzene, you could also call it as a 1 chlorobenzene. In this case, we have a CH3 group, and we have another CH3 group down here. This is that position one, two, three. This technically would be a one, three dimethyl benzene. And this is also known as silene in the meta arrangement. So let's take a moment and just draw some structural formulas, okay? These are more of the kinds that I might actually ask you. In this case, I'm asking you to draw a 1,3-dichlorobenzene. So remember, draw the benzene ring. That's the first thing we're going to do to start with. Draw our benzene. And at position 1 and position 3, we have something. We have a dichloro. That means you have a Cl, Cl. 1,3-dichlorobenzene. On the other one, an orthochlorotoluene. We again throwing you for a loop on this one. Ortho remember is the same as saying a one two. Okay, so one two orthochlorotoluene. So in this case, we're going to draw our benzene ring and toluene. Toluene means it's a CH three group. So let's put the CH three. Ortho means we have something at position two, okay? Automatically, because it's toluene, this has to be the one arrangement. That's the one. So the chloro, because there's no di or tri or tetra in front of it, just means it's just one chloro group. And that chloro group is actually at position two, Cl, okay? So this is an orthochlorotoluene. The other way of naming this, um, which is the name I would probably ask you, would be a 2-chlorotoluene. Okay. Because at position 2 is that chlorine. So there they are for you, right there. Just to end, I want you to tell me what organic family they are associated with, and we'll name them as well. In this case, one, two, three, four, with a double bond. This is an alkene. Technically, this is a butene, or one butene, because it's happening in carbon one. This is a cycloalkane, and this is cyclopropane. Here, we have a triple bond. So this is an alkyne. This is te technically a propyne or one propyne. And here is our benzene just by itself. This is an aromatic family group. So that's it, guys. If you have any questions whatsoever, please let me know.